welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. If you would honor the Lord, stand to your feet. I'm going to get down on my knees and let's go before the Lord together today in prayer. Invite the Holy Spirit to come and be our teacher. Father, today we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for what you've already done in this church service. Thank you for your presence, Lord. Thank you that as we draw near today, God, that you draw near to us. Father, as we open up your word, we pray that you would open it up to us. Open us up to receive it, Lord. Give us eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. May it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. God, we would ask that you come and give us the vision, the wisdom, the direction, the comfort, and the strength for each and every day, Lord. We praise you and thank you that your word is planted deep in our hearts, God, and produces fruit in each and every one of our individual lives. How awesome you are, God, that you can speak a now word, an individual word to each and every person in this place, God. We give you thanks and praise and glory and honor for that. Lord, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we would ask it upon all the churches that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Lord, there are brothers and sisters. No time do we think of ourselves as better than anybody, but we think of ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field building your kingdom. God, bless those churches. Bless them this day as you would bless us, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, amen. amen. You can have a seat. Get your Bibles out and go with me to the book of Hebrews. If you missed last week, you missed a monumental event. We went from Hebrews chapter number four into Hebrews chapter number five, and so we have launched into uh, Hebrews chapter number five. And not only that, we're covering some ground. We did actually five verses we launched into last time we were together. Pastor Jim brought a message, God's choice is you, and that was part number one. Today we're going to read uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1 through 5, and we're going to launch into God's choice is you, part number two. This is actually part number two. We're continuing the thoughts from last week. If you missed last week, don't worry about it. We're going to review, catch up, get you brought to the place where we need to go, and today the message will bless you right where you're at. God's choice is you, part number two. Hebrews chapter number 5, verse number 1 through verse number 5. Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 1 says this, for every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. Now stop right there for a second. We, we've already heard in the book of Hebrews chapter 1 through 4 about the preeminence of Jesus Christ, how he's greater than the prophets, greater than the law, greater than Aaron, greater than Moses, greater than Joshua, right? Heard how Jesus the Son is greater than the angels and, and, and how he has the highest place. And now we've, we've been introduced to this concept that Jesus Christ is our high priest. And by comparison and contrasting with the earthly high priest, now we get an understanding about who Jesus, our high priest, is in heaven. So talking about the earthly high priest, it says every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men and things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Verse number two, he can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray since he himself is also subject to weakness. See, the earthly high priest w was flawed just like we are. He was, a, he was a man taken from among men, but Jesus Christ, our high priest, our heavenly high priest, we know, was without sin. Yes, he was subject to the weakness. Yes, he experienced temptation, experienced the human experience while on the planet, and yet was without sin. Verse number three, because of this, he is required as for the people, so also for himself to offer sacrifices for sins. See, the earthly high priest had to offer sacrifices for himself as well as for the people. Jesus, in contrast, became the sacrifice for you and I because he was the perfect, spotless, sinless lamb. Verse number four, no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. So we see that there was an earthly calling for the earthly high priest. He was called by God, he was chosen, he was selected by men, and then he was commissioned, and he was set forth to do the work. Verse number five says, so also, so in the same manner that the earthly high priest was chosen, was called, and was commissioned, now here we see Jesus Christ, so also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he, capital H speaking of God, who said to him, capital H speaking of Jesus, you are my son, today I have begotten you. So what do we gather from this verse? We find out that just as the earthly high priest was chosen, was called, and was commissioned. Now here Jesus was chosen, was called, and was commissioned. And now 
The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse number 5 and 6, and 2 Peter, chapter 2, that we are now, by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, made to be kings and priests here on the earth, that we are now chosen, called, and commissioned by God, that we have a purpose on the planet, we are to be kings and priests here on the earth, and that we have a ministry, a service as kings and priests. Last week when we got together, we said, well, who can God use in their calling? Who is the type of person that God can use in their calling? And we made this statement that God can use those that. You remember the four things Pastor Jim taught us last week about God can use those that, number one, separate from the world. That if we are called, we are called out of the world. We are to be separate. We are to be holy. And we are to be just like Jesus was, exclusively God's. That we are separate from the world. That we don't intermingle. That we don't intermarry with the world. That we're not yoked up with the things of the world. We're not allowing those things back into our lives that once held us in bondage. No, we're breaking away from those things and we're separating to, from those things unto God. God can use those. That number two, you remember this, want to walk worthy. Sometimes we get so defeated and so down and so depressed and say, I can't do it. I give up. No, you've got to want it. You've got to desire it. You've got to want to walk worthy. And as you desire it, yeah, you may mess up, and then there'll be some time you mess up again, and then there's more time. You mess up maybe down the road a bit, but you know what? You're getting the victory. You're on your road. You want to walk worthy, and as you desire that, then your life will start to change and conform to the Word of God until you're walking worthy and you're getting on with the things of God. God can use those at number three. We learn this, that are dependent on him. It's not about our strength, not about our ability. No, we tap into the power of God. Just like Jesus said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. You can do nothing apart from me. We now are dependent on God for everything. We are now humbling ourselves and, and, and coming under the mission of God and, and, and just tapping into the power of God and are totally, 100% dependent on him. God can use someone like that. God can use those that, number four, and I like this one, are filled with hope. You remember that we talked about hope and how hope is that blueprint that faith can go to work on and that as we have hope in our hearts, now all of a sudden God can use us. Why? Because we've got a vision. We've got an expectation for the future and God goes to work on that vision. God goes to work on that expectation. The Bible says hope does not disappoint when it's in God. God can use those that, which brings us to what we're going to take a look at today. I'm going to teach you three more things from the Word of God that God can use those that do some other things and we're going to learn about these and incorporate them into our lives today. Are you ready? Yes. Praise the Lord. God can use those that, number five, are diligent. God can use those that are diligent. What does that mean, to be diligent? It means that you're diligent about your calling. It means that you're getting busy about the things of God in your life. That you take your calling so seriously that you're not going to be idle, you're not going to be passive, you're not going to be slothful. You know, the Bible talks about the sloth many times, the person who, who, who's so lazy, they go and reach uh, their hand into the bag of chips, and they can't even bring their hand out of the bag of potato chips. Hello. That's the modern-day San Bernardino translation, by the way. But God says that the diligent hand shall be made rich, and the diligent shall rule. See, we are to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. We are to be kings and priests here on the earth. And a lazy king, a slothful king, isn't going to get the job done. A lazy priest, a slothful priest, is not going to get the job done. And so we've got to do our job. We've got to be serious about our calling. We've got to get busy with the things of God, just like Jesus left us an example. At a very young age, here he is in the temple teaching the teachers. And his parents show up and they say, man, boy, you've been driving us crazy. Where have you been? He said, didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? What is that? That's diligence. That's him going after the things of God. And we ought to take that example and say, you know what? I'm going to get busy with the things of God. I'm going to go after the things of God each and every day. I like this little anecdote I read. It says this, every day in Africa, a gazelle wakes up. It knows that it must run faster than the fastest lion or it will be killed. Every morning in Africa, a lion wakes up. It knows that it must run faster than the slowest gazelle or it will starve to death. Doesn't matter if you're a lion or a gazelle, when the sun comes up in the morning, you better be running. <laughs> See, as Christians, 
It doesn't matter what your calling is. Some of you guys are called to the business world. Some of you guys are called to be a doctor or a lawyer or a plumber or a construction worker. Some of you guys are called to work uh, as clerical support or uh, an IT person. You know, different callings. God has put you in these different places. Maybe your calling is in education or your calling is at home and you're raising a family. It doesn't matter where your calling is at, what God has put in your hand. When the sun comes up in the morning, you better be running. Are you listening? How does that play out? Well, that means that if you're a lawyer, you're the best lawyer for Jesus Christ that you could be. How does that play out? If you're a doctor, you are best serving the people that you are, you are helping to on, on their process of healing and on their road to recovery, that, that, that you do that as unto the Lord and you take care of those people like you would take care of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. How does that play out in the home? If you're a homemaker and you're raising a family, and you're raising up those kids, you view your job as so important. Why? Because you are literally impacting the future by raising up children who will be raised up in the ways of the Lord that they shall not depart from it when they grow old. You see... Your calling is the highest calling that God has for you. It would be a step down for you to become an earthly king or president or parliament member or whatever it may be. Why? Because God has placed you in that position strategically because he has a holy calling for you. And you are to be diligent about that calling, diligent about sharing your faith, diligent about seeing what God wants you to do, diligent about your assignment here on the planet. You're there in the book of Hebrews. Turn a couple books back to the book of 2 Peter. After Hebrews, you'll find James, 1 Peter, and then 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter number 1. 2 Peter chapter number 1. We're going to take a look at verse number 10. 2 Peter chapter 1. Verse number 10 says this. It says, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent... To make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. Now we say, what are these things? What are these things he's talking about? I don't want to stumble. I don't want to mess up. I, I want to make sure that my calling and election are, are, are strong and steady. So, so what are these things that he's talking about? Well, you notice the very first word is therefore. That therefore we've been taught is there for a reason. In other words, because of what I just said in the prior verses. Verse number five through verse number seven, you'll find a list of things that he says to add to your life, add to your faith, uh, goodness, and the goodness, knowledge, and all self-control, self-control, perseverance, perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness, love. Because if you do these things, therefore, brethren, be even more diligent. See, it sounds like a long list, but you just do one at a time. You add them to your life. One by one, you get these things incorporated in your life. You start to believe God, and then as you start to believe God, you start to add that virtue, that goodness. You start to, to do the will of God, goodness, knowledge, knowledge, self-control. You start to do the will of God, do the way of God, self-control, perseverance. You, you endure, and you go through things, and you go, go and, you, and you're strong and steady in the way of the Lord, and, and perseverance, godliness to godliness, brotherly kindness. You start to reach out to other people into brotherly kindness, love. See, that God wants to get you in love because love is the supreme power of the universe. And when you operate in that love, what does he say? If you be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, if you're diligent about the things of God and you're incorporating these things into your life, then you will never stumble. You will be on point. You will be following the ways of God. But if you don't do these things, you're going to find yourself getting off the road, getting tripped up. You're going to stumble. That's what this is all about today for you and I. God can use those that are diligent. Being diligent of all these things will make our calling sure. Number five, God can use those that are diligent. Number six today, God can use those that, number six, reflect his glory. God can use those that reflect his glory. What does that mean? What does glory mean? If you've been in this church for any period of time, you know that we define the word glory as God's manifested goodness. Well, okay, what does that mean? Well, God was, was speaking to Moses. Moses said, Lord, I want to see your glory. And God said, no, no man can look on my face and, and live. And so I'm going to pass by you, and you can see my, my hind parts, but you're not going to be able to see my face, so I'll cover you in the cleft of the rock, and, and I will pass by you, and I will declare my goodness before you. And as he passes by, he declares the glory of the Lord. So we see that it's defined in the Bible that the glory of God is not some illumination. It's not some brightness or some shining thing around God. No, the glory of God is the manifested goodness of God. Manifested, what does that mean? The appearing, 
the, the, the open, the, the on display for everyone to see. So for you and I, when we reflect God's glory, when we shine forth the goodness of God and display it for all mankind to see, now God can use us. Now God can get a hold of our lives and our calling and he can show forth his glory in us. Jesus Christ said, you are the light of the world. See, oftentimes we think about it like this. Here's the sun and here's the moon, right? And if, if we were out there on a dark night and there's, there's no illumination, you can't see anything. Walking around, can't even see your hand in front of your face. But when the moon is reflecting the sun on a full moon, all of a sudden it's almost like daytime. You can see everything. You can see every pitfall. You can see every stumbling point. You can see every rock, every, every dip and dive in the road, and you can now go about but, you know, God took it a step further, and he said, you are the light of the world. What does that mean? That means he imparts his glory to you and I. And now we are light bearers, and the Bible says that we are to shine like stars in the universe, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. So you and I are to take a look at God, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, and, and make sure that we're walking in our calling, being diligent about the things of God, and then imitating what God would do. I believe that's what Jesus was speaking about when he said that it's advantageous for you that I go to the Father. Why? Because if I go to the Father, I'll send the Holy Spirit. And now that the Holy Spirit is living on the inside of you, now you can reflect the glory, the goodness of God. You can manifest and put it on display. And he said, the works that I do, greater works than these shall you do. Now we say, well, wait a second. Greater, greater in quality? No, no, no. Greater in quantity. Why? Because there was one Jesus walking around on the planet. Now there are millions of Christians all over the planet that are filled with the Spirit of God who are reflecting His glory. And as we do, God will use us to do a quantity of works all over the earth. That means that it's not just Pastor Dan, Pastor Jim, Pastor Deborah, Pastor Luke, or Pastor Jess. Any, any, it's not about us. No, it's about all of us going out. Did you know that you can reach places that I can't reach? You can go to your neighborhood and speak to your neighbors that I don't know. You, you can go down to the supermarket where you got relationships with the, the checker and, and the gas station where you got a relationship with the person there working the counter. Or, you know, the different places that you go, the education system, the people that are teaching your kids. And you have a platform, you have a pulpit that I can't preach from. You are the one that is called to be the distributor of God's goodness to the Inland Empire and around the world. Take a look at it in the word you're there in 2 Peter. Turn back in your Bible to 2 Thessalonians. Go back through Hebrews. You'll find Titus and Timothy. And keep going back to you. Find 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. We're going to take a look at chapter 2. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, let's take a look at verse number 13 and verse number 14. Let's take a look at this together. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 13 says this, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you. Oh, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Did you hear that? God from the beginning chose you and 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 me. What does that mean? God from the beginning. God before we ever existed. God before we were formed in our mother's womb. God knew us. The Bible says God can tell the end from the beginning. God knows us completely. God knows the, the road that we've walked and the path that we're on. God knows all of our insecurities and insufficiencies. God knows every, every sin and every triumph. God knows every weakness and every strength in you and I. And God, knowing all that, still chose you. Why? Because he loves you. See, we've all felt the pain and the rejection from an early age of people not choosing us. Maybe it started on the schoolyard when you were young. You remember that? Everybody's about to go play kickball. What do they do? Everybody line up. Line everybody up, right? And you're all standing there. And whoever's the coolest or the one that owns the ball or, you know, whoever it is, they're the team captain. They say, okay, I'm team captain. And then this person can be team captain, another sporty person, another person that, that is good looking, you know, and athletic and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so we're the two team captains. Now we're going to start picking. They start picking, right? I want you. Okay, I get you. Okay, I, I get you. Okay, oh, man, they chose him. Okay, I'll, I'll take you. All right, and, they, and they're picking. And, and there you are standing there saying, hey, all right, come on. Look, at, look at, I, got my, I got my kicking shoes on, and, and I'm, ready, I'm ready to go here. Okay, come on, pick. 
right, right over here. Right, no, 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 don't pick the, no, don't pick the girl before me, right? <laughs> and, and you're standing there, and you're the last one, and you felt that pain, and they said, oh, okay, fine, I guess, come on, be on our team, let's take the walk. You kind of hang your head and walk behind them, and then what do they do? They put you in the outfield, right? Here, you stand here and don't move. <laughs> if the ball comes to you, just get it and do something with it. I don't even know, right? You carried that pain and that rejection with you. And then you grew up a little bit, maybe in high school or college. You, you started noticing people of the opposite sex. Started looking around. Saw some sweet thing walking around, right? Good looking. And you mustered enough courage up to approach them. And, and, and you, you said, well, hey, um, you know, like... Uh, what do, you, what do you think about maybe going out sometime, hanging out, get a cup of coffee or, you know, something, burger? I, I don't know. What do you like? And they said, oh, I'm busy that day. He said, I, di I didn't mention a day. <laughs> and so you carried that pain and that rejection, and, and, and then you went on, you got a job, and you were working hard at that job, you thought you were doing good, and you, and you started to excel, and you're you producing the numbers you need to produce, and all of a sudden on the job board, you saw that there was a promotion, there, there was some available, and you said, you know what, I got this, I got the numbers to do it, I, I, I qualify, I, I got this job, and you put your application in, and you submit it, and you didn't hear back. Somebody else came along, and they said, hey, guess what, I got the job, and you said, oh, Congratulations. And you go back to your boss and you say, well, I just want to know why. I just want to know what happened. They just say, well, I'm sorry. They, they just are a better candidate for the position. And you're doing a great job where you're at. You just stay there. And you got passed up. You felt that rejection. Why? Because you weren't chosen. You were rejected. And yet God says... In his words, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 13, but we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord. God loves you. How do we know that? Because God, from the beginning, chose you. God wanted you on his team. God wanted relationship with you. And God wants to promote you to your heavenly calling. God, from the beginning, chose you for what? For salvation, through sanctification by the Spirit, and belief in the truth. See, God sets you apart. Sanctification, that's the process. That's, that's, that's the, the, yes, the position that you have is righteous, but there's a process to set yourself aside for God and consecrate yourself and, and walk worthy and all that stuff that we've been talking about. Through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Verse 14, to which he called you. Notice there was a choosing, but now he has called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's your commission. Right there to go out there and to display the manifested goodness of God. Obtaining the glory of God. Shining forth his brightness. Why? Because he loves you so much. And you love him. And now you're going out there and you're being an imitator of Jesus Christ. You're out there praying for the sick. Laying hands on people. Getting people saved. Preaching the gospel. Doing the works of God. Being the best you that you can be. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. What have we learned so far? That God can use those that, number one, are diligent, or I should say number five, are diligent. God can use those that, number six, reflect his glory. Last thing for today, number seven, God can use those that keep on keeping on. You know what I mean when I say keep on keeping on? Maybe you've heard that term. How, how, how about the truckers, okay? Any truckers in here? What do you say? Keep on trucking, right? What are you doing? You're pushing through. You're persevering. You're enduring. God can use somebody that's tough and that endures and that bears up under the weight and the pressures of this life and keeps on keeping on. See, this is not something that you're called to every Sunday and then you live the rest of the week however you want. No, you got to keep on keeping on. This is not something that, that just the church people, you know, you come into church, you pay your pay. No, 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 no. No, this is an endurance race. This is not a sprint. This is not a little dabble do you. No, this is for people that keep on keeping on. Jesus said, he who endures to the end shall be saved. God can use somebody that's going to bear up and endure under the pressure, keep going. 
love what Dr. David Livingston said. He needed missionaries to come and help him in the work that he was doing in Africa. And in writing back to the missionary organization, he said that he didn't want men who would only come if there was a good road. He wanted men who would come if there was no road at all. Are you listening? What does that mean? That means that, hey, doesn't matter the adversity, doesn't matter the circumstances that I'm facing, doesn't matter the pressure that's coming against me, the financial strain that's going to be on my life. I may not be able to see the road, but yet faith is, is, is walking in the ways of God, and, and we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith, and we believe God, and we follow the leading of the Lord, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, and we keep on keeping on. You're there in the book of 2 Thessalonians. Turn back to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter number 3, great passage of Scripture. Philippians chapter number 3, and we're going to start reading in verse number 12, and we'll go through verse number 14. Now, they may or may not have verse number 12 up on the overhead for you. That's why we bring our Bibles, just in case the preacher adds a verse. Amen. Philippians chapter 3, verse number 12, Paul writes, he says, not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on. I keep on keeping on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. See, there was a time where Paul was persecuting the church, dragging Christians out of their homes, throwing them in jail and approving of their deaths, breathing out threats against the church, and yet Jesus Christ got a hold of him, and now as passionate as he was in persecuting the church, now that's how passionate he is in building the church. And so he says, I press on, I keep on, Keep it on. And you and I, we've got to commit that however passionate we were in the world, however passionate we were about being lazy, however passionate we were about being sinful, however passionate we were about building our own empire, whatever that may be for you, whatever road you've walked, now you turn that energy and that effort into the things of God, and you keep on keeping on. You press on. Come hell or high water. And listen, both of them came against Paul. I mean, how would you like this? You go and you preach the gospel and they throw you out of town. You go to the next town, you start to preach, and they follow you. I'd have threw up my hands and said, God, I give up. They threw me out of that town. I went to this town. They followed me, God. And yet God says, I haven't called you to slow down, to stop, or to quit at the first hard point. Listen, Christianity's tough. I'm sorry if you've been sold this thing that it's a bed of roses, it's easy street. No, it is not easy street. It's an uphill battle. The Bible says the road is narrow, difficult to find. Many are called, but few are chosen. Why? Because it's tough. It's hard. And it's, it's our human nature to want to slow down, to want to stop, to want to coast, to want to quit, and just float through life wherever the current takes us. And yet, that current oftentimes is not going the direction of God. You've got to swim upstream you got to be so determined and say, listen, it doesn't matter the circumstances. It doesn't matter what I'm facing. It doesn't matter what's coming against me. The whole world could be coming against me, and yet I'm on God's team. God's chosen me, and I'm going to keep on keeping on. Whew. Back to Philippians, verse 13, chapter 3. It says, brethren, I do not count myself to as apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. And reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press, I press, I press, I keep on, keep it on. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I'm sorry, am I getting too excited for you? See, the called are in it forever. This is not a fly-by-night commitment, little, little bit here, little bit there. You know, uh, I did it once, and that's a No, listen, this is a call for the rest of our life into eternity. <laughs> Jesus Christ is a high priest perfected forever, the Bible says. And therefore, you and I, when we hit the finish line on earth, that's just the beginning. We have an eternal job with God. We have an eternal priesthood. Why? Because we are in Christ Jesus, and he's a priest Forever, the Bible says. We don't stop at the finish line. First Peter chapter 5, verse number 10. Turn there with me. You were there in 2 Peter. Now turn with me to 1 Peter. After Hebrews and James, you'll find 1 Peter chapter 5, right at the end of chapter 5. Great verse, verse number 10. Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 10. 
Look at what it says. But may the God of all grace. What is grace? God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on your behalf when you can't do it. What is grace? God's power in me to do what his truth demands of me. That's what grace is. Grace is not an excuse. Grace is not a get-out-of-jail-free card. No, grace is empowerment. Grace, yes, grace is for salvation, but grace is also for holy living. Grace is also to do the hard things that you need to do. Grace is also to keep on keeping on. And may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory, his eternal manifested goodness by Christ Jesus, look at this, after you have suffered a while. Come on, somebody. Some of you guys are suffering. You say, I don't know when it's going to end. I don't know when it's going to quit. My wife and I were talking the other day. We said, we've been battling. We've just been in a fight. We have been fighting the good fight. Where's the end of this thing? And yet God says, after you have suffered, not just suffered, a while. We don't like those promises in the Bible. Come on, let's be honest. It's like everybody who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. God, why did you have to say that? And yet look at what he says. He promises grace. He promises the ability. He promises that you can do this. You can keep on keeping on. After you've suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. My goodness, that's what this is all about. Let me end with this. Steve Jobs, you guys know Steve Jobs. He was the founder of Apple Computers, recently passed away. He wanted to recruit 38-year-old John Scully, who was the president of Pepsi-Cola. Jobs called him on the phone. He issued a tremendous challenge to Scully, and he asked him, he says, do you want to spend the rest of your life selling sugared water, or do you want an opportunity to change the world? Christians, Christians, do you want to spend the rest of your life with a sugared water existence, or do you want a chance to change the world? As you and I are used of God, as we continue and as we keep on keeping on, it will change the world that you and I live in. It will literally impact generations, and it will change the community. It will change the culture. This goes into all areas. And we can do this by the grace of God. What did we learn? Well, so far in this series, we had learned that God can use those that, number one, separate from the world. Number two, want to walk worthy. Number three, are dependent on him. And number four, are filled with hope. Today, what did we learn? We learned that God can use those that are diligent, that we're busy about our Father's business in every arena of our life. Number six, we learned that God can use those that reflect his glory, that we are to be the distributors of God's goodness here on the planet. And finally, we learned today that God can use those that keep on keeping on. If you got something from the word of the Lord today, come on, give God a great big praise. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask everybody to remain put for a second. Next couple moments for some of you are the most important moments of your entire life. I just want you to stay put for a second. No one get up. No one leave during this time. Turn off your cell phones, pagers, any noise-making devices, and focus in. Because God has something for you. We'll let you go in a couple minutes, all right? This is the most important thing for some of you in this room. And I'm going to ask everybody to respect the move of the Holy Spirit as we minister to hearts and lives right now. I want to ask you a question. I want you to answer the question in your heart. No one will know the answer but you and God. What if today was your last day here on the earth? You died and you went to eternity. Where would you end up after everything was all said and done? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Just answer that question in your heart. No, 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 the answer but you and God. Where would you go? Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Now, I don't think anybody in this room is dumb enough to say, well, I want to go to hell, party on. No. Because hell is a place of torment. No one wants to go there. Come on, let's be real. Let's be honest. You don't want to go to hell. A lot of times people dismiss hell by saying, well, I don't believe in hell, Pastor. Yeah, you know, I don't believe that a good God would send people to hell. Well, he doesn't. We choose it by our life here on the planet. Hell was never made for you and I, by the way. It was made for the devil and his angels who rebelled. And so God didn't want you to go to hell, but you can choose it. Sometimes people say, well, no, wait a second. All roads lead to heaven, and God's a good God. He's loving and, and, and gives grace, and therefore, we're, we're going to go to heaven however we live. It doesn't matter. Well, it does matter because the Bible doesn't say all roads lead to heaven. That's like saying all roads lead to the moon. Mm-mm. you got to get there one way. Jesus Christ came, and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me.
Not going to get there your way. Not going to get there my way, some well-meaning church committee's way or whatever the way of the world is. No. You get there one way. A lot of times people say, well, yeah, that's cool. I, 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 I can get there God's way, you know, because I know that God's way is by being good. And, and I've been a really good person, done a lot of good deeds in my life. I used to be bad, but, you know, now I'm, now I'm being good, working on my resume with God and making sure that when I go before the throne of God, I can show him how good I am and God will let me into heaven because I've been a good person. You know that nowhere in the Bible? Nowhere in the Bible so you can be good enough to get to heaven. It doesn't work like that. You're not going to get to heaven just by being good. Check it out. In fact, the Bible says that if you're trying to get to heaven by your goodness, that your good works compared to God's works are like filthy rags and they're going to get thrown out. Not going to make it to heaven just by being good. Come on, let's love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough today to tell you the truth, not play games. You're not going to make it if you're trying to get to heaven just by being good. There's only one who is perfect. His name is Jesus. You got to get there God's way. Sometimes people say, but I was raised in church. Parents told me I was a Christian growing up. Took me to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, maybe Sabbath school class. Hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized a Christian as a child. You're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America gets to go to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, right? Wrong. Nowhere in the Bible. Check it out. Nowhere. Nowhere. Nowhere in the Bible say you raised in church, parents tell you Christian, that makes you Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you went to religious classes, wear religious jewelry, be baptized or Christian as a child, be born in America, that you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible do I see that because you're not some other religion, that by default God loves you in the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven and denying hell. Not going to make it. That's how you think you're going to get to go to heaven. So you might be thinking, well, pastor, I understand that, but you know, uh, not only when I was a child did I go to church here, I'm sitting in church today, right here in front of you. That's great, I'm glad you're here today, but show that, show that to me in the Bible, would you, where you sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian? It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. That's like saying I can go down to the Pacific Ocean, sit in the water, call myself a Christian, that, or call myself a fish, and that makes me a fish. Mm -mm. No, just a wet human sitting in the water. Nowhere in the Bible says sit in church service, call yourself Christian. That makes you Christian. Sometimes people say, but wait a second, Pastor. In, the, in my last church I got involved, I helped out. I carried the pastor's Bible, sang in the choir, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I even got a membership card to that church and taught in the Bible classes. That's great. I'm glad you did those things. But once again, could you show that to me in the Bible? Where you help out, get involved, sing in the choir, make decisions. People think of you as a leader. You carry the pastor's Bible and teach in the Bible classes. You get to go to heaven. It's not there. And again, nowhere in the Bible do I see God waiting at the gates of heaven looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter. Simply not going to make it if that's how you think you're going to get to heaven. Come on, let's love you enough to tell you the truth today. So you say, but wait a second, Pastor. Someone told me that if I know God, that makes me a Christian. I know God. I know about Jesus. Celebrate Easter and the resurrection every year of my life, sing the songs of Christmas. I, I could quote scriptures to you, Pastor. I I'll tell you Bible stories out of the Old and New Testament. That's great. I'm glad you can do those things, but show that to me in the Bible, could you, where you have some head knowledge about who Jesus is and that gets you into heaven. It doesn't work like that. In fact, if you read your Bible, you'd know that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible says the devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures in the Bible, and yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. Look up here. Look up here. Not about what you have in your head. Not about some mental ascent towards God having head knowledge about who Jesus is and that gets you into heaven. No, rather, this is about your heart. God's always been after your heart. All through the Bible, God is looking at your heart and your life, which follows your heart. Jesus was speaking to a religious leader of his day by the name of Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a good guy, did good deeds, raised up in his church, became one of the leaders, got involved could quote the scriptures, could sing the scriptures, could, could debate the scriptures, gave his money and did a lot of good deeds. And yet, we would have thought he would have been patted on the back by Jesus. Jesus would have told him, good job, man, thumbs up. Keep doing what you're doing. I'll see you in heaven. But he doesn't say that at all. What does he say? He says, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. Now, a lot of times that turns people off because they've heard what society said about being born again, and they thought, oh, it's weird, it's crazy, it's, it's nuts, it's all. But listen, not about what society says. Listen, they, they may have raked it through the coals and made it out to be something that it's not, but that's not the definition of what the Bible says being born again is. What does being born again mean from the, from the Bible? Well, 
from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. All or nothing with God, let me prove it to you. Book of Revelation, third chapter, Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us sitting in this church today. He says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, what does he say? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little in, little out. A little up, little down, little token prayer every now and again. Occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Why do I say that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today I'm going to give you an opportunity. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So today, your call, your choice. In a moment, I'm going to go like this. One, two, three. Bang. Pop my hands together just like that. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, bang. That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count on it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, whoa. Mm, time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh. Get over it. Why? Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? And no one would make that trade. Today, come on. Let's give God all of your heart and all of your life. You can do that in safe and friendly church service. Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, it's better than ending up in hell. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by foyer, in the television, Back there in the Love Rock Cafe or online all around the nation and all over the world. Come on, you can get right with God. God is watching. Then you can tell an usher or come into the church service. Or if you're online, you can click the button that says respond to God. Who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on today, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never given God all your heart and life? Come on today, you can do that. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know that's the condition of your heart. When I described it, you can get right with God by simply raising your hand, acknowledging your need for Jesus, and then we're going to lead you in a prayer right afterwards. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just pop them up high. Thank you. There's one. There's two. God bless you. Where are you at? Come on, come on, come on. There's three. Thank you. There's three. There's four. Gotcha. God bless you. There's four wise people. There's five. Thank you. There's six. There's seven. God bless you. There's eight. There's nine. Thank you. There's ten up there. Thank you. Back in the family rooms. Gotcha. Ten wise people already. Ten people already. There's eleven. Thank you. Twelve. Thank you. Thirteen. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else real quick that I didn't already see? About thirteen wise people already. Come on. If that's you, you need to get your hand up and get right with God. You know you need to do this. Come on, you're not alone. I didn't embarrass them, and I won't embarrass you. Thank you, number 14, back in the family rooms. Gotcha. Anybody else real quick? Anybody else real quick? Come on, if I, if I haven't seen it, wave it at me. Let me know. Back in the foyer? Okay, thank you. God bless you. Got you right there. Gotcha. Thank you, 15, 16. Up top, thank you, 17. Gotcha. Got you right there. Where are you at, number 18? You're sitting there wondering if you should do this. Come on. Come on, you should do this. Go for it. Go for it, number 18. Come on, just pop it up high when I'm looking your direction. Anybody else real quick? About 17 wise people already. Come on, number 18. You're sitting there wondering if you should. You should. God is tugging on your heartstrings right now. You need to do this. Anybody else real quick? Real quick, I'm going I'm to close this up, and you're going to miss this. Don't miss. Thank you, number 18, back in the family room. God bless you. Number 19, come on. Come on. Don't miss this opportunity. You've missed enough opportunities. Thank you, number 19. God bless you. Come on, number 20. Number 20, where you at? Go for it. Go for it. You were just waiting. You were just waiting. If that's you, just pop it up right now. Pop it up. Come on, number 20. Know that God is speaking to you right now. Just let go. Come on. Thank you, number 20. God bless you. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 20 wise people. <laughs> Hallelujah. Here's what we're going to do. All 20 of you, or there's 10 more, total of 30 that need to get their hearts right with the Lord today. If that's you, you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. Not too late yet. Here's what we're going to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand. No one's going to leave during this time because we're going to respect the move of God on these people's lives and allow them to come forward. Okay? So if you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, we're all going to stand. We're going to give a clap and a shout. 
If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, get your stuff, get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies today, but we can't do that till we get you down here. So come on, let's all stand. No one leave. Let's welcome them. And if you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, you come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on. They're coming. Come on, let's give them a hand as they come. From the family rooms, if you raise your hand, bring your kids. They're welcome. Come on. Come on, bring them on down. They'll remember this. Hallelujah. You can come too. Come on. Come on. Tell your neighbor, I gotta, I gotta get down here. Let me out of the aisle. Come on. Tell your neighbor, come on, friend, I'll go with you. Bring them right now. Bring them right now. Come on down. You're not alone. Hallelujah. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Anybody else if you need to come? Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So excited for you guys. So excited for you guys. Thank God you guys have come. Listen, you didn't respond to me. No, you responded to the Holy Spirit. You can put a smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing, okay? Now, I want to explain to you what's about to happen. See this guy right over here, this guy in the black shirt and the hat? This is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave's a really good guy. Nothing weird is going to go on, okay? You know, sometimes you go to church and wonder, are they weird? Mm -mm. He's cool, all right? Here's what he's going to do. He's going to pray with you a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. Then he's going to give you some free stuff, okay? A couple little booklets that our pastors wrote that'll help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. After that, he's going to introduce you to a friend we have here in the church called a spiritual personal trainer. You heard of a physical trainer at the gym helps you get strong, helps you get buff, just like me, right? What are you guys laughing at? Spiritual personal trainer will do that for you spiritually. They'll help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. It's a five-week process. It's easy and it's free. You need to do it. Now listen, 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 listen. I'm going to make a promise to you, okay? You give us one year of your life here at this church. One year. Commit to sitting under the teaching here at The Rock. One year. At the end of that year, you will look back and say, wow, I never knew it could be this good. And the rest of your life is going to be set on a course that you will be so blessed, you just won't know what to do with yourself, all right? Now, sometimes people say, but pastor, I have my own church. Really? Because you, you, you came here today, and you responded to God here today, and if you had died in that other church in the position that you were in, you'd have gone to hell. So I would say that you need to come and get where God is moving in your life. That's here, all right? Now, I'm, I'm writing my application, putting in my resume to be your pastor. Okay? Our commitment here at The Rock is to love you, to teach you an uncompromised word of God, and to build you strong in the ways of the Lord. That's our commitment, okay? But you got to help us by coming back to church, committing your heart and life to Jesus here. Okay? You didn't join a church. You gave your heart and life to the Lord. But we want to be your church, and we want to help you on your walk with God. Okay? That one year all starts with five weeks with an SPT. So if you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave right this way. Give him a hand as they go. Woo! Hallelujah.